Good afternoon. This is Patrick D. McCoy, the African American voice in classical music, and I want to welcome you to this very special show, the first show during Black History Month. Today we are honored to have Dr. Daryl Taylor, counter tenor and founder of the African American Art Song Alliance. He drops in today to speak to us about the 2012 conference that is scheduled to take place next week at the University of California at Irvine. Good afternoon, Daryl. Good afternoon. I'm glad you're here today. So let's jump right in. Tell us about the conference coming up next week. Well, um, the African American Art Song Alliance, uh, I founded in uh, 1997, so this will mark 15 years of continuous activity of trying to disperse information about uh, composers of African American, uh, African American composers of, of song and the singers and the scholars who, um, who support that, that effort. Um, so the conference starts February 9th um, and extends all the way through February 12th. We have outstanding um, personalities coming, um, Donnie Ray Albert, Carmen Balthrop, Marquita Lister, um, George Shirley, Hilda Harris, Willis Patterson, H. Leslie Adams, Robert Owens, Adolphus Hale Stork. I mean, the list is, is go, it goes on. Um, William Chapman Yaho, Louise Toppin. Uh, it's, and every day there are um, panel discussions, lectures, uh, poster presentations, and, of course, performances. And everything is uh, free and open to the public. It's uh, it's quite uh, e- extraordinary that uh, the University of California has uh, provided the support to such extent that we didn't uh, we did not require or need to require a uh, a uh, registration. Wow, that is such an impressive roster of singers, and they're more impressive to have all of those singers and noted composers and scholars all under one roof. How exciting! Yeah. Exactly so, and in particularly considering Robert Owens is coming from Munich for this. Uh, Bonita Hyman is coming from Frankfurt, um, and, and Robert Owens is 86 years old. To, so to make that journey at, at 86, um, it, it's a real rare gift for us. Mm. Could you maybe speak specifically to some of the premieres that are going to take place? I do know that you have some noted composers who will be in the house, such as Leslie Adams. Could you maybe speak to some of the specific musical highlights of the conference? Well, there will be a world premiere of a new song by Leslie Adams. It's not so new, actually. It's been it's a couple of years old, but it's never been performed, um, called Blues People. Or, gosh, let me pull up the program because I think I just called it wrong. I think I called it the, the, <laughs> title wrong, but there's a new song uh, by Leslie Adams, and there's a, a new song cycle by uh, Robert Owens on poetry of, of Arthur Rimbaud, called Rimbaud uh, Cabaret, uh, that I'll be performing, um, and then uh, pieces that probably, I'm, I'm not sure if they've been heard in California uh, or if they've been heard in the West, Um it's very hard to to know to triangulate exactly how many of these pieces have been performed and and where, but I know that there's another um, uh, world premiere of a piece by Charles Ingram um, called Silver Swan, being done by um, by Kimberly Davis. Mm, so fascinating. Now you kind of allude to the purpose of the conference when I first um, asked you about hosting the event at the University of California, but could you maybe talk about the importance of the African American Art Song Alliance? As you mentioned, you founded it back in, in 1997. Could you maybe talk about more in depth about what inspired you to create the alliance? Well, I was a um, – it goes back to my own studies at um, both the University of Southern California and the University of Michigan. When I was – at the University of Southern California, I found it very difficult to find music or information about composers of color, and I was inquisitive, but it was very, very difficult. And and um, beyond that, you know, I was an undergraduate, and I didn't really know how to use a library to its um, maximum benefit. Um, I 
expected that once I got to graduate school that that would change uh, dramatically. And I went to the University of Michigan and had Willis Patterson as a as a graduate advisor and George Shirley as my teacher. So um, I did have an advantage in 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 uh, acquiring some information, but I was struck by the fact that none of my courses um, covered African Americans to any uh, notable degree. Um, I then took it upon myself to make it um, my mission for every every um, paper, every project that was due for for any given class in my graduate studies to focus that on. Uh, some area of having to do with African Americans, and thereby I educated myself. At the head of this was a, um, a an independent study I did with Willis Patterson, where he asked me to um, do a 30-page paper. And the paper, the uh, topic that I did was well, what's so important about studying African American art song. Uh, he was impressed by the paper and suggested that I, I seek to get it published. I got that published uh, in the Journal of Singing uh, under the title The Importance of Studying African American Art Song in uh, the January 1998 issue. And um, that then became the, the genesis of, of, of the, Af- the Art Song Alliance because, of course, in 1998, that's um, about the flowering and of of the internet and and access to information and um i you know during my um my oral defense uh, for my dma uh, dean patterson put a question to me he said well now who is responsible for disseminating this information and i said well that i thought that it really should fall to the um the black celebrities in, in opera or composers, conductors that were doing well, um, they should they should take up that mantle. But barring that, um, were that not to, to take place, then it falls to young scholars. And I will never forget, he looked right at me and he said, and who are the young scholars? And a light went on over my head and I said, oh, that's me. <laughs> and so... So I took it as I took the the the, the cue from that. I said it's my it's it's my turn to to uh, to take a lead in in uh, disseminating information, and thus the African American Art Song Alliance was born. Well, I just want to say on behalf of so many of us, thank you. You've done such a wonderful job gathering all of us together, and as you mentioned, now we're all under one roof under the uh, aegis of your page, your Facebook page, which is devoted to the Art Song Alliance, African American Art Song Alliance. So I want to thank you for that. And when thank you. you. In 1998, oh, yes, indeed. And I remember when I, in 1998, I was a student at Virginia State University, and that's why I first came across um, your work, and it was amazing and an honor for me to meet you so many years later. Well, in fact, just this last year in Philadelphia at the NAM conference, so many thanks to you. Yeah, we had a good time, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, in your work, you've done all of this work and focusing and bringing light to these treasures by African American uh, composers, particularly art song. Uh, fascinating. One thing that fascinates me about you that even though you have specialized some de- in some degree, you you have such a flowering career not only as a tenor but now as a counter tenor and singing uh, some of the wonderful music not only by African American composers but some of the Baroque gems. Uh, of, of the Baroque period. So could you maybe speak to uh, your career as a singer and, and particularly your transition from being a tenor to now a counter tenor? Well, you know, it always comes as a shock to people, especially if they know anything about my, my recordings and, and performances when they when they see my name associated with counter tenor. Um, but I've always had this, this kind of um, ability. I Put it on display in my in my singing as a tenor uh, with with high singing that was soft, but I always knew that there's a lot more there that I just don't get a chance to uh, to display, and the the repertoire is limited to such extent that I, it really doesn't show what all I can do, and the only way to 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 really show off exactly what I could do was to to change Fox. Um, you know, if I had my druthers, I would love to be able to sing both tenor and counter tenor, but there is a um, an overlapping where the, the ranges are um, uh, 
share the same space, but they're they're incompatible. The approach is incompatible. And so you have to make a choice. You have to decide, are you going to do a tenor or are you going to do a counter tenor? And so I've, at least for this period, I'm, I'm, I'm focused entirely on counter tenor and have been for the about now so five years, five, six years. Um, yeah, it, 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 there's an interesting sideline. There's a, it, it, there's a soprano in Detroit by the name of Daryl Taylor, and, and, and I think everyone always must have thought when, when they heard Daryl Taylor and they heard um, my, my countertenor voice come out, they must have thought, oh, that must be uh, Daryl Taylor from Rutherford High School in, in, in Detroit. <laughs> but no, indeed, it's, it's me. <laughs> oh, wow. That is amazing. Now, people who live here in Washington, D.C. Uh, may recall that you were uh, featured in the performance of Handel Solomon uh, for the inaugural concert of the City Choir of Washington, uh, conducted by Robert Schaefer. So uh, that's just an amazing uh, thing to, to see you now associated with this great music of the Baroque period. Now, talk to me about, I know you have an a, a engagement coming up in Holland. Uh, speak to me about that. Well, I'm uh, I've recently engaged to sing the the role of of Orfeo in Orfeo ed Euridice of Gluck uh in in um Utrecht. Um it's a, a run of 40 performances. I'll do 20 of those performances and my colleague Gary Boyce will do the other 20. And um it's actually really exciting. It's um it's done outdoors on a lake at the at one of the, the royal palaces, and um, we we the, the lake symbolizes the river Styx and um, the chorus and the dancers and I and and um, Eurydice as well all get in that water and we sing and the the orchestra is kind of floated above it and uh, it, it, with with fire and and uh, uh, all kinds of spectacle about it. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I'm I'm, I'm excited about it. It sounds quite exciting, and we're going to keep keep following that, and I'll be sure to do all my research and, and make some posting. Now, as we continue to talk about your uh, career um, as a singer, and even though I didn't write this, this is something I always like to to ask anybody. What was your initial inspiration to pursue a career as a singer or in music general? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> you know I. Hmm. Well, I had a, a, an older sister who sang, and um, and so you know, initially it was me just following behind, following in the footsteps of my sister, uh, and I, I sang in gospel choirs in Detroit, and um, that I thought was a, an interesting sort of side line, a certain uh, nice uh, avocation, but but not particularly something that one would put one's one's life effort into making a living and um it wasn't really into i to be honest with you uh, patrick i thought that i was going to be the next Peebo bryson i i really thought that that was where the the world was calling me and i was all prepared for that and um when it was time for me to enter college i had no resources and zero resources except that I could sing. And so I very naively <laughs> applied to the University of Southern California, one of the finest <laughs> institutions, because my my voice teacher at the time said, you have to go to USC. So I said, okay. And I didn't apply anywhere else. I just applied to USC, and I auditioned for them. And they, you know, to my great shock, gave me a, a scholarship. And I was, okay, great. Well, I guess we'll do this. And and once I was there, it, it became apparent to me that there was another part of my being that was dormant until uh, I, I did this study. Once I, I dug into my artistry and dug into um, poetry and and um, the inner lo- life of a character, um, I found that that, I, that there's really a part of me that 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 no one would have access to if i don't if i don't perform and thus my my artistry was born and and uh i've i've not looked back on it since and and i'm i'm very grateful to be we we're very privileged as singers i tell my students this all the time we're very privileged as singers that we get to 
as part of our work, um, dig into poetry and uh, to to be acquainted with historical figures and um, ways of thinking that the person going to a nine to five job um, might not have that same um, that same they certainly have access to it, but not necessar- necessarily the same imperative to 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 be uh, exposed to it. Mm. That's amazing. And one other thing that's amazing to me is that you have a certain wholeness uh, to your complete artistry. You you have this essence of you that's a scholar. You have this essence of you that is an actual performer, performer of literature, and and that brings me to. Uh, my next point, as far as uh, we were talking about your career as a singer, you recorded several projects and so forth. Could you maybe speak to your most uh, recent recording uh, project, Charm of Spirituals? Uh, How Sweet the Sound, A Charm of Spirituals. I ju- just did that for Albany Records of the, uh, with, uh, the, under the sub uh, label of uh, Videmus. Um this marks my my tenth year of recording with uh, Albany, and uh, this but this is my first recording as a counter tenor. It's very interesting to to, to have these uh, these anniversaries happen this way after ten years, and, and suddenly maybe in, in another ten years I'll start recording as a baritone. Who knows? <laughs> and um, uh, it is intended. The, the title is intended very subtly to let. Anyone looking at it knows that this isn't your typical recording of spirituals. These are all art songs, very artfully crafted, and respecting the spiritual as art song and not just as uh, some sort of very slow uh, gospel um, or, or or some some wing of, of gospel music, but in, indeed a, a, a branch of classical music and um, intended. Um, by the by, the arrangers to be respected that way. That's very important, and and I'm and I'm glad that you have recorded such work because, as you said, sometimes people uh, mistakenly associate the spiritual as another branch of gospel, and that's and that's not the case. So I would encourage you all to to uh, definitely purchase that um, project, and I would certainly make that link available on my Facebook page and, and Twitter and so forth, so you can definitely uh, make that as a part of your listening library. Now, you had mentioned your time um, in Michigan, and I want to uh, just to have you speak a little bit about the noted tenor George Shirley. Could you maybe reflect on his, his role and in maybe influence in your career? Oh, gosh. Well, I first met George Shirley in, in 1987 when he came out to Los Angeles for a presentation that was being done by the city of Los Angeles and um, um, Betty Cox, who was a commissioner under the, the then mayor uh, Tom Bradley, had invited me to perform on that as a young artist. And uh, I was, of course, so excited to, to be uh, in the presence of George Shirley. George then he recruited me for graduate studies there at the University of Michigan. And uh, what can I say about George? He's um He's so much more to me than um, just a a someone that taught me uh, during my graduate studies. He's been my mentor. He's been my friend, and uh, he's a, he's a father to me. So uh, he my my time at the University of Michigan was such. I mean, I, you can imagine how blessed I feel that um, under the the watchful eye of George Shirley. I became a man, and I learned what it was like to be a man, and and um, what how one conducts oneself, what one is responsible for, and um, and the power that that carries, the responsibility that 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 carries. Because he, he lived it in in his teaching, he lived it in his day to day being, um, and it's a, it was a great privilege to to have him as my teacher. That's certainly wonderful, and. And I'm certainly thankful for you and the African American Art Song Alliance. I think it's wonderful how you're bringing such light to uh, these treasures of African American composers. And I, I certainly want to thank you for that. Now, just to recap, if people want to come and, and register for the conference, where would they find all of that uh, information? Well, if you go to the um, 
web page for the music department here at the Claire Travis School of the Arts at the University of California. Um, there is a, a link that, that will give you the conference schedule. There's no actual registration. Uh, we will, of course, um, try as best we can to, to um, list what people are there so that we can do some follow-up and um, um, make sure that we have some continual contact. But as I said before, there's no, there's no, they, there's no paid registration. Everything is you just show up. <laughs> and, and because I did, I, I did that intentionally. I didn't want there to be a barrier. I didn't want there to be a reason why young people couldn't come. Why uh, anyone within the, the the who was able to get to Southern California couldn't participate in this? And I have to emphasize, I don't do this every year. I do this you know, like once every five years, and so um, each time, I, I the the intention is that it, each time would be very very special, and um, and if you miss it, you miss something big, something significant. Oh my goodness. Dr. Daryl Taylor, thank you so much for joining us today to speak to us about the 2012 African American Art Song Alliance Conference at the University of California at Irvine. We are certainly thank you for you for bringing this this project into fruition. And just as I close, I, and of course, I always like to close with any great singer and scholar of caliber. If you had to offer advice to any young person uh, listening today, as far as maybe just one tidbit of advice as far as aspiring to a career uh, in craft music of the arts. What piece of advice perhaps would that be? Well, for a young person, I would say that the, the, the field of music is vast. The opportunities are immense, but you can't sit back and necessarily wait for those opportunities to present themselves that um, you need to, if if it's at all possible for you to see where your unique gifts can amplify or add to, or um, um, if you find that there's a hole in something that you can fill, I think that that's a, a that's a, a you could make a name for oneself easily by um, by paying heed to that, paying attention to it. I would also say that. For young people, your career begins once you begin to study. That's you're, you're in your career, and if you recognize that, then you'll take very seriously what it is that you're doing when you're doing it, because you're in your career. You're not just uh, a high school student anymore. You're a college student or you're uh, a young professional. This, this is your career. Um, I, I point out that you know, W.C. wrote Boswell when he was 16, uh, Langston Hughes wrote the the Negro Speaks of Rivers when he was 19. So and and Leontine Price uh, throughout her career listed her her activity at, at, in the Juilliard Opera Studio. Um, th- those are were important things and and so take take what you're doing very seriously and um, and I think people would then take you seriously. Mm. There you have it, folks. Thank you so much, Daryl, for joining us today. We've been speaking with Dr. Daryl Taylor, who is the founder of the African American Art Song Alliance. And I do want to encourage you, if you're in the California area, or if not, it's not too late, to go out to the University of California at Irvine for the African American Art Song Alliance Conference, which is going to be held February 9th through the 12th. There is no registration fee, and it's a a free conference, and what an opportunity to hear some of the world's greatest uh, artists unearth some of uh, our great African American art songs and treasures. Again, this has been Patrick D. McCoy, the African American voice in classical music. And I do want to thank you for joining us for this very special interview, and I wish you all a great day. <laughs>